Good afternoon. This is Anna Pinedo from Mayor Brown, and I am joined by my partner, Jennifer Carlson. Thank you very much for joining us for our webcast on pipe transactions. We're going to go through some pipe basics as well as current developments. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get going. If you'd like to ask questions, use the Q&A widget on the screen. Jen and I will try and answer questions as we're going through the webcast. And if we run out of time, then we'll get back to you each individually through uh, email. For those of you who are joining us today who would like CLE credit for the live version of the presentation, download both the affirmation form and the evaluation form. You can find the forms in the resources widget on the screen. And then when we're about halfway through, uh, we will announce the CLE code. And uh, you should just add that CLE code information to the forms when you send those back to us for CLE credit. You can download the presentation as well as the supplemental materials from the resources widget. As well, after today's presentation, um, you'll get an email from us that will have uh, the webcast slides, the supplemental materials, and a recording of the session. So uh, you may want to look out for those. Uh, with that behind us, I'm uh, going to go ahead and get going before I hand off to Jen. So uh, in terms of agenda, as I said, we're going to focus on laying the groundwork with uh, a few basics, and then we're going to concentrate our discussion with uh, focusing on um, the transactions that are most relevant now um, with uh, venture, private equity, and uh, existing stockholders as investors, um, as opposed to uh, the more traditional pipe transactions. So in terms of market trends, over time, uh, there have been ebbs and flows in the trends we've seen with respect to pipe transactions. Um, as more issuers have become eligible to use a shelf registration statement, so when the baby shelf rules were modified, uh, for example, we saw a decline in the number of pipe transactions since more issuers could file a shelf pardon me, and undertake a uh, shelf takedown as a follow-on transaction. So we've seen more transactions uh, that are done as shelf takedowns that might, in times past, at least for smaller issuers, have taken the form of a pipe transaction. As well with the evolution of wall cross or confidentially marketed public offerings, there have been uh, more issuers choosing that approach, uh, whereas they might have found appealing the same sort of wall-crossed confidential marketing um, in uh, a pipe transaction. What makes pipes particularly relevant for uh, this particular period is that what we've seen time and again um, in uh, 1997, during the dot-com bubble, and of course during the financial crisis, is that pipe transactions are particularly useful when there is a, a downturn and when there are prolonged periods of market volatility. So uh, just as a point of reference on this slide, uh, you'll see some pipe market trends. And I think what's most notable is if we look to 2008, uh, so if, if you assume that the financial crisis began sort of in mid-2007 and continued maybe until 2010, uh, you see a very significant volume of pipe transactions having gotten done in 2008. And of course, a lot of these were large injections from private equity and traditional venture investors into public companies, particularly into uh, financial services companies. And then, of course, healthy activity continued um, in 2009 and uh, in 2010 as the market stabilized, the volume of pipes declined a bit. 
but overall, as you see, year-on-year -year pipes remain a, a very uh, compelling transaction alternative. So if we go uh, to the next slide and uh, you just look at the number of transactions and sort of the composition of the transactions in periods of relative market stability, uh, there are uh, most of the pipe transactions that are getting done have been common stock deals or common stock and warrant transactions. And uh, there's been a migration away from preferred stock, convertible, or more highly structured transactions. As I'll explain, though, today, uh, during periods of market volatility, like those that we're experiencing, um, what you're likely to see is a uh, return of more highly structured uh, deals, and in particular, uh, transactions that are uh, private equity driven, uh, largely preferred, convertible preferred, or structured debt. And so we will focus on those. Um, with that, I'm going to hand things off to Jen to just lay the groundwork with some basics about pipes. Thanks, Anna. So I'm going to go through, as Anna mentioned, just some pipe basics and uh, a little bit on key documentation for pipe transactions and also some key considerations. So first, just generally, what is a pipe? transaction. Uh, there are many different types of pipe transactions or things that can qualify as, a, as people recognize as a pipe transaction, but broadly it refers to a private placement of equity or equity-linked securities by a public issuer. And as Anna mentioned, she'll cover some of those different types of transactions today that include venture style or change of control, strategics, um, and then there's also highly structured securities that can be involved in pipe transactions. So the pipe was created in response to regulatory changes that allowed for abbreviated shelf registration statements. Uh, a traditional pipe is typically the sale of common stock to accredited investors at a fixed price, and it's conditioned on a resale registration statement for the investors to be able to sell the securities, and that resale registration statement is typically available promptly after the closing of the pipe. So there's lower liquidity risk when that resale registration statement is available and a lower liquidity discount. Um, so issuers and the issuer and the investors will up enter into a purchase agreement and the investors will commit to purchase a fixed amount of the securities at the fixed price. The purchase agreement itself or sometimes a separate registration rights agreement commits the issuer to filing the, re the registration statement for the benefit of investors. And typically, a pipe will consist of primary shares, which just means that it's the issuer offering uh, new shares directly to the investors, but it can also be in the form of a secondary offering or a combined primary and secondary offering. So as I mentioned, you can have a traditional pipe where common stock is sold to AIs, accredited investors, at the fixed price. You can also have a, um, a, a private placement or a, an sort of an untraditional pipe with the delayed registration rights or trailing resale registration rights. And, it, and that's where the company commits to filing and having the registration statement declared effective by the SEC within a negotiated time post-closing. There can also be structured pipes involving other types of equity or equity-linked securities, so preferred, convertible preferred, convertible debt, warrants, these are typically more heavily negotiated, and it may involve a conversion price for the securities that's subject to adjustment, and in that case, the issuer may bear some market risk. And there's also um, the venture style pipe, change of control pipes, the PE strategics that Anna will cover. So investors in pipes traditionally involve accredited investors, or AIs, and that's a very broad category of investors, and investors can include hedge funds, mutual funds, uh, pension funds, private equity funds. Many of the, fund, the funds can be associated with financial services companies. Um, they're also formed by money management firms, investment advisors, or families. And also venture funds um, have become involved in pipes. And you know, that, that's probably to leverage their existing strategies 
their industry expertise or, or maintaining their existing ownership in portfolio companies. And most funds have their own investment criteria for the issuers and for the investment itself in the pipe. So besides common stock, which is the traditional security sold in most pipes, and we saw that in the market trend slides earlier, you can have convertible preferred, convertible debt, um, and those are often structured as dividend or interest-bearing securities, and that could also include PIC or payment in kind interest. Um, and the, the interest is based on a negotiated fixed or floating rate. And you can have warrants, a uh, combination of warrants and common stock. You can have other equity-like securities, and you can also have any combination of the above. So what are some of the advantages of pipe offerings to the issuer? So transaction expenses are typically much lower than other financings. It's efficient and it's quick compared to an underwritten or a 144A offering. Uh, the marketing is typically more targeted and, and smaller because you have a, a smaller base of investors you're going after. Um, but it also allows the issuer to target those institutional or accredited investors, which can be highly valued um, by investors. Uh, it also helps, importantly, to avoid you know, shorting that can occur, or speculative trading that can occur when an issuer announces a public offering. So typically for a registered deal or public offering, the issuer is going to announce that deal um, at the beginning of the marketing. So nothing's been sold yet, no one's committed, but the marketing is underway. And what happens then is that there's usually a negative impact on the stock price. Um, there's, there's push down from investors who see the announcement. Um, but a pipe, in contrast, is usually not announced publicly until the purchase agreement is executed and the price is fixed. So it helps to avoid some of those speculative, speculative trading issues. Um, one thing to note that the pipe form generally doesn't work in non-US jurisdictions um, because there are preemptive rights over the issuance of new securities for existing investors. Um, and lastly, there's streamlined offering materials for pipes. They're very short or in some circumstances, some circumstances no private placement memorandum compared to a longer OM for a 144A offering or a prospectus. And the resale shelf itself, if the issuer is S3 eligible, can also be quite short. So what about disadvantages? Um, well, the securities sold are generally sold with a dis uh, liquidity discount because they're not sold publicly and there's a resale registration statement that needs to be declared effective. Um, and therefore they're dilutive to existing investors. Investors in pipes will sometimes want warrant coverage in addition to the securities purchased at the closing. Um, there is limited marketing, sometimes as I mentioned to accredited investors, that can be a good thing to reach those, that investor base, but it also limits who you can reach as your investors. And as Anna will discuss, uh, but later in, later in more detail, there can be limits on the number of shares that may be sold due to the um, Securities Exchange 20% rule. And also, um, the last bullet mentions um, there are suspensions on the use of the resale registration statement, and the issuer will want these in case of material developments. But what happens is that the investors will demand a limit on those suspensions or the times that they aren't able to use that resale shelf. And the issuer will then likely have penalties associated with the suspensions if they go beyond the number of suspensions they're allowed to do. So again, as I mentioned, um, traditional pipes uh, are just the regular common stock at a fixed price to accredited investors with um, the closing that's conditioned mainly on the SEC being ready to declare uh, the registration statement effective shortly thereafter, shortly after closing. Um, but also, as I mentioned, there's uh, a private placement with trailing resale registration rights. And that's um, where the issuer affects the registration after the closing of the private placement. So just a few notes on trailing resale rights. Um, once the investors enter into the purchase agreement, the closing can occur. And after the closing, the issuer then will file and use its best efforts, commercially reasonable efforts, or, or some other negotiated standard to have the registration statement declared effective. And in the, in the purchase agreement um, or in the separate registration rights agreement, that is where the investor and the issuers will negotiate 
to specify the timing deadlines. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the penalty payments that can be associated with missing certain of those deadlines. And we'll discuss some of these negotiated provisions in a few minutes. Um, but there's also, as I, as I have mentioned, some limits on the number of times that an issuer can suspend the resale registration statements. And those are referred to as blackout periods. Um, <clears throat> the issuer will list the selling stockholders in the registration statement as selling stockholders. And it, the issuer is typically bound to keep that registration statement effective for a period of time. Um, sometimes it's a max period of one or two years. Um, other times it's you know, just until the investors are able to sell all of their shares without limitation under Rule 144. And one thing to note here, as the last bill it, um, talks about, is that if affiliates are involved, they are subject to the volume limitations and other limitations of 144. So they'll typically push back if there's just a set time period. So I wanted to go through um, briefly some of the key documents in a pipe offering. There's the engagement letter, um, offering materials, or in some circumstances, as I mentioned, there is not a PPM. So there's just reliance on the existing filed documents with the SEC. Uh, purchase agreement, maybe a reg rights agreement, legal opinions, and other closing documents. Um, and then a press release and a Form 8K and the resale registration statement. So for traditional pipes, most issuers will engage a placement agent, and that will help them structure and market the pipe. And the engagement letter just basically outlines the obligations between the issuer and the placement agent. The placement agent is not a party to the other pipe documents unless they're also an investor in the pipe. And generally, there's a fee paid to the agent of between about 4 to 6% of the gross proceeds to the issuer. Um, in some circumstances, the agents can also receive warrants as compensation, and the issuer typically reimburses fees and expenses to the agent. And then usually um, a more frequently negotiated part of that engagement letter is the tail period. So that's where the issuer agrees to pay the agent a fee if other offerings occur within a future time period. Um, sometimes there's, uh, it, it, depending upon the transaction exemption you're looking at, if it's 4A2 or, or Reg D, there may be some bad actor representations. Um, there's also indemnification where the issuer agrees to indemnify the agent for untrue statements in the offering docs. So the purchase agreement, um, again, the agent's typically not a party unless it's an investor, so it's, it's between the issuer and the investors. Um, the agent will normally assist in preparing the purchase agreement along with its counsel, so there'll be a form purchase agreement when you go out to um, solicit investors, and that will typically be an exhibit to your PPM. There's issuer reps and warranties, and those are similar to a traditional underwritten offering. Um, one of the reps will be that the investor when the offering is closed and, and announced, um, won't have MNPI, and that allows the investor to then be able to trade in the market if the issuer has announced that the, the MNPI. Um, the issuer covenants, general covenants, usually just to make that transaction public, to file the registration statement, and to provide certain closing documents. Um, investor representations are typically very, very limited, as you'll see here. There's usually also indemnification by the issuer to the investor for losses for untrue statements of material fact in the resale registration statement. Um, other covenants that, that might be contained in the purchase agreement, and this is depending upon the investors or the type of transaction, so typically in a structured um, pipe where you have more highly complicated securities, the investors will demand other types of affirmative and negative covenants, including corporate governance or information requirements. And generally, for most pipes, the closing documents will only include a legal opinion, but there, there could also be a comfort letter um, or issuer certificates. And then closing condi conditions are also typically quite limited to, to MAC and the closing of those documents. So as I mentioned, the registration rights provisions of a purchase agreement or a reg rights agreement are typically heavily negotiated. Um, at, the issuer will, will commit to filing and having the registration statement declared effective within a certain period of time. Um, and there's typically liquidated damages provisions where the issuer agrees to pay penalties for not meeting those time periods. And usually there are negotiated limits um, for the blackout periods that I mentioned. So the number of times an issuer can suspend 
the ability for issuers to use the registration statement. And that's typically for material events that may be occurring or coming up, such as an acquisition. Um, and there's usually penalties for violating that covenant as well. There's typically no piggyback registration rights, and by that we just mean that if an issuer files a registration statement for a different purpose, the pipe investors can't um, join in on that registration statement. And it, there's usually also a covenant, the last bullet here mentions, there's usually also a covenant um, that other registration statements should not be declared effective before the pipe resale registration statement. But there's certain exceptions, including for Form S-8. So as we mentioned, um, a PPM, if there is one, will typically be very short, and it'll either include or incorporate by reference the issuer's Exchange Act filings. And rarely in a PPM is there more information on the issuer's business than what's publicly available, unless, of course, it's necessary to ensure that the investor has all info to make their investment decision. So if there, for example, is a material acquisition coming up or some other material event that hasn't been publicly announced, perhaps the pipe's being used to, uh, to help finance that, then the investors will have to know some of that information in order to make their decision. And the investors typically don't want this. They don't want to have non-public information, um, so that's why they will require the issuer to promptly disclose that information to the public once the closing has occurred. And that will um, usually occur via, the disclosure will occur via 135 compliant press release. Um, and the issuer will also typically file a Form 8K at the closing that may, uh, may disclose information under Reg FD, item 701, um, but could also disclose the material agreement under 101 and under 302, unregistered sales of equity securities. So for the shelf registration statement itself, um, an issuer generally doesn't need to be S3 eligible on a primary basis to complete a pipe. And on a primary basis, that just means the issuer's ability to, to use the registration statement to issue new securities directly to the public. Um, but an issuer in a pipe can use a Form S1 or a Form S3 for resale um, in connection with a pipe transaction. And there's some wrinkles to this that I'll go over in a minute. Um, regarding the SEC's analysis. But it's most efficient, generally, for an issuer to use a short-form S3. It's less costly, it's less time-consuming than the long-form S1. Um, you can incorporate future Exchange Act documents by reference without filing a post-effective amendment. So the investors and the issuer will want to have the issuer be S3 eligible, and there'll be reps and diligence around that. So can an issuer use an existing shelf? Generally, the answer to that is no, um, unless it's a WICSI. Um, an existing shelf that a, a pipe issuer will have up will most likely just be for primary offerings only, so they will need to file a new separate resale shelf to cover the resale of the securities by their pipe investors. And here's the issue that I mentioned just a minute ago. Um, for issuers that are not eligible to use Form S3 on a primary basis, for a long time, the SEC has expressed concerns over whether the pipe transaction is, is actually a disguised primary, um, if the pipe results in a disproportionate increase in the issuer's total shares outstanding. And this will come up you know, generally in SEC comments to the S3. So the SEC's guideline is, and rule of thumb is generally that it allows um, the S3, if the shares registered equal less than one-third of the issuer's public float, but um, the SEC will typically look at the facts and circumstances surrounding the transaction, including the factors that we've listed here. That said, um, we also have heard that the SEC may allow registration to continue um, if the securities are common stock uh, or have fixed conversion or exercise prices rather than having characteristics that could, um, could have a further dilutive impact on the issuer's outstanding shareholders, although there is no official guidance on this point. Um, the SEC has also said that where it won't allow the resale registration statement to proceed, the issuer can decrease the number of shares registered initially on that S3, and then after six months, assuming that original tranche that was registered has, has all been sold, after six months, the issuer can then register more shares on a new S3. Um, and as I mentioned, at that, at that point in time, the original tr tranche should all be sold. But since it's been six months, uh, 
um, the investors in that second tranche can usually rely on 144, so it may not be as helpful to use this exception. So just quickly, I wanted to go through some considerations for and around placement agents. Um, Reg FD in general, which is Regulation Fair Disclosure, uh, that's the SEC rules that govern selective disclosure by companies of material non-public information. And the SEC considers this to be a form of insider trading. Um, various recipients of the material non-public info um, are covered by Regulation FD, but are some that are some, there are some that are exempt as well. And in a pipe specifically, um, a placement agent and others that owe a duty of confidence to the issuer, so an accountant or other participants that owe a duty of confidence generally to the issuer, they're exempt from Regulation D. So the issuer may share material non-public information with them, but um, the issuer may not share that information with investors in the pipe unless the investor expressly agrees to maintain that information in confidence. So what happens is that typically the PPM in the pipe is limited to what's in the Exchange Act reports. So the investors don't get any material non-public information about the issuer's business. But um, uh, as we bold it on the slide here, the fact that an issuer is contemplating a pipe transaction may itself constitute MMPI. So what's an issuer to do? Um, the issuer should ensure that the placement agent gets an oral agreement from each potential pipe purchaser that it contacts before revealing the issuer's identity. Um, and it makes sure that the, the potential investor also agrees to keep any confidential, any information confidential about the issuer's identity. And the oral agreement can be documented through, and usually is documented through subsequent email exchanges. And this will help to ensure that Reg FD is not violated by the issuer. But the investor, of course, is still subject to insider trading rules, and I'll discuss that in a minute. So again, um, best practices for confidentiality. Um, there can be oral scripts with confirmatory emails. There can also be actual confidentiality, signed confidentiality agreements. Um, the first step is typically an oral script, but an agent sometimes can also have an omnibus uh, confidentiality agreement with certain repeat clients, and those investors have agreed in advance to keep the information confidential when they're contacted about new issuers. Um, but you should still use the oral script. Um, there also may be separate confidentiality agreements, as I mentioned, signed prior to the purchase agreement being signed. And the purchase agreement will usually contain reps to the issuer on confidentiality. But um, that said, considering that all, not all of the potential purchasers will actually end up purchasing and signing the purchase agreement, you'll want to consider in the placement agent will want to help you consider um, at whether you want a separate confidentiality agreement that's signed apart from the purchase agreement. And this is especially important if the offering materials contain certain information that's not in the Exchange Act, the public filings, um, such as an acquisition or some other material event, or as we'll talk about much later, um, related to COVID-19. So there's also you know, some best practices that the agents should follow that the issuer should be aware of. The agent should confirm that the potential investors have appropriate information walls and procedures to help prevent Reg FD and insider trading violations. Um, and then it, typically, uh, internally, they, the placement agent will have a process and procedures for their marketing team. So for who's involved in marketing, you know, how are they trained, how are they supervised, um, what information gets sent to potential investors, so, you know, typically there's the screening process that they mentioned that pre-qualify investors, there's confidentiality restrictions, but you want to make sure that the team and the placement agent is adequately trained and supervised. And there should also, um, at least for compliance purposes, the placement agent will want to keep written records showing that they actually had reached out and confirmed confidentiality and in some cases gotten written affirmation of confidentiality from the, um, the potential investors. So it's important to keep a careful, careful record of that. Uh, quickly. Todd, I think we may just want to move on and, and yeah, talk I about material non-public information when we get to COVID. Yep, I think that sounds good. So we'll cover more MNPI 
um, and issues related to investors having material non-public information and that disclosure to the public later. Um, let me go ahead and pass it over to Anna to discuss a little bit about venture, private equity, and change of control pipes. Okay, so as I mentioned early on, most of the transactions that are going to be most relevant at this particular juncture are going to be uh, transactions that are more highly structured, and uh, we're seeing a significant amount of interest from traditional VC funds as well as from private equity funds, distressed debt funds, and others that may see opportunities at present. They may be interested in investing in public companies, uh, either in sectors that they think are uh, undergoing stress right now or uh, because they have long-standing investments in the sector and may feel that it's appropriate at this juncture to um, increase the size of their holdings at uh, a price that may um, be undervalued when looked at from a long-term perspective. So typically, it makes most sense to structure these kinds of investments in the form of a pipe. Even if the company had a shelf registration statement and the shelf registration statement were current, and at this juncture, I think that many companies uh, may be uh, a little reluctant to provide investor updates or to <coughs> do standalone investor presentations or 8Ks to update on their financial situation. So uh, there may be some reluctance for those reasons, but more particularly because through a private placement transaction, it's going to be uh, easier to structure a more highly customized investment. And by and large, uh, private equity investors will want, and, and VC investors in particular, will want to do uh, more uh, thorough diligence or more uh, of their own diligence. This obviously is going to depend on the funds. Some funds will not want uh, to receive any material non-public information other than the fact that the company is considering doing an offering or may want to receive information, but only with the caveat that they're going to be cleansed pretty promptly after the announcement of the pipe transaction. These types of investors are likely going to want other contractual protections for example, affirmative or negative covenants, and we're going to talk a little bit about these, and may, in some instances, want board representation. So oftentimes, these transactions, because of the highly structured nature and because of the fact that uh, investors are coming in at a time when the stock of the company may be under pressure and these are significant investments, may represent a change of control for the company. And that raises a number of, of different concerns uh, that don't ordinarily come up in your run-of-the-mill pipe transaction. So from a contractual perspective, to the extent that the company and company counsel have analyzed and concluded that the transaction might be deemed a change of control, <clears throat> it would make sense to review company agreements. So oftentimes, uh, lending arrangements, employment agreements, option agreements have change of control triggers. Again, it's going to be very dependent on the facts and circumstances of both the investment and the terms of these agreements, but it's well worth reviewing all of these documents to make sure that uh, no uh, change of control provisions are triggered there. There may be charter provisions uh, or uh, for uh, companies in particular sectors, for example, REITs, uh, companies uh, that are in the shipping business, uh, companies that are otherwise regulated, where there may be specific ownership limitations. And in order to waive those ownership limitations, unexpressed waiver may be required. Or there may be requirements that no more than, that a single holder can uh, acquire no more than a certain percentage of voting control. And so that may require additional structuring in order to make sure that even if a new investor has a significant economic control, their voting control over that particular percentage limit is uh, 
is dealt with uh, through a proxy. There also may be change of control provisions in other agreements, warrants. <coughs> Many debt securities have change of control put uh, provisions. And then, of course, uh, the securities exchange provisions. So those are some of the structuring concerns, and we'll get into the shareholder vote uh, issues in more detail. In addition, for a lot of these companies, it may be prudent for them to undertake the transaction, even if the transaction is quite dilutive. However, the fact that it may be a very dilutive transaction to existing stockholders may raise concerns. And so the board of directors may want to undertake a more uh, thorough process than it otherwise might in connection with documenting its considerations of the various transaction alternatives. For example, if the board has various term sheets or various proposals in front of it, it may want to uh, enlist the help of the placement agent in evaluating uh, the various merits, discussing those with the board. It may invite the placement agent or another financial advisor to present to the board. And it's important to consider um, in the context of any particularly dilutive transaction that there may be uh, questions raised in hindsight uh, regarding the appropriateness of the transaction and the board's diligence in terms of considering other alternatives and whether under the business judgment rule uh, this was uh, a sensible um, choice to make. Related to that is uh, change of control premium. So to the extent that an issuer is conveying a control stake through the transaction, it also merits discussion with the placement agent and with the board whether, in fact, the issuer is being paid for uh, that control premium. So a control premium, uh, general, generally, in connection with acquiring a control stake, uh, other than in a situation which is very distressed, it would be uh, it would be considered reasonable that a premium would be paid. Obviously, these are very difficult market circumstances. We're seeing many transactions get done at, uh, at terms that uh, we would not see under ordinary or non-stressed market conditions, but it's important to document uh, the board's consideration of all of these issues. As I mentioned, <coughs> because boards have owe certain duties to shareholders, again, in effectively discharging those duties. It's going to be important that the board engage in a very thorough uh, discussion and an evaluation of all of the other reasonable alternatives. There may even be some instances where a board might decide that it would make sense for the board to obtain a fairness opinion. So we have seen uh, a number of instances where in a very dilutive transaction uh, that involves a change of control, perhaps where a shareholder vote may be required and there will be a proxy, that there is a, a fairness opinion that really analyzes uh, the, the terms of the transaction and the consideration that's going to be paid. Of course, all of this uh, could be looked at in the context of litigation. And so uh, it's also sensible to consider uh, and discuss with uh, litigation colleagues um, the terms of the transaction. So in addition to all of the other, the contract review that I mentioned and uh, consideration that you might give as, uh, as directors or as uh, officers of the company to reasonable alternatives, there may be a number of other approvals. So shareholder approval, which we'll get to next, but also depending on the transaction size and whether uh, there's an ability to rely on uh, the passive investor uh, exception, there may be uh, an antitrust filing that's required. So uh, if you have multiple investors coming in, uh, 
those investors are not getting any board seats and they're not getting any special information rights, blocking rights, or other rights that would suggest that they're taking an active role in uh, the company's direction and management, then perhaps uh, we could set aside the antitrust considerations. And then again, depending on the industry and the structure of the transaction, CFIUS may become an issue as well. Continuing along, uh, the other uh, type of transaction that becomes very relevant in distressed uh, environments are uh, transactions with existing stockholders as well as with strategic investors. So often uh, a company that realizes it needs a, a capital injection may turn to some of its existing stockholders and uh, they might be affiliated with directors uh, or with officers or may simply be uh, may simply have a large position in uh, the stock. So here as well, <coughs> there are a number of special considerations in addition to those that I mentioned previously. For example, do these insiders have information that's different from the information that's going to be shared with other potential pipe purchasers? Or are they going to be subject to a different blackout period than the rest of the purchasers? If there are third parties that are coming in, are they going to participate on the same terms, on different terms as the board, at least the unaffiliated or disinterested directors? Have they considered the whether it's prudent to allow a uh, related party transaction in uh, a transaction that may later, uh, in hindsight, be viewed as dilutive uh, or simply not uh, favorable to uh, the unaffiliated stockholders. Of course, um, there also will be stock exchange limitations. In the case of a strategic investor, oftentimes uh, a strategic partner of the company may know the company very well may um, have respect for the company and appreciate that the company's stock may be undervalued and want to make an investment. So uh, an investment from a strategic uh, can raise a lot of the same concerns. Uh, maybe change of control issues, definitely highly structured securities. There may be commercial agreements that get uh, that are negotiated at the same time or that get renegotiated if a commercial agreement already exists, and there may be uh, requests for board or observer rights. While a lot of private equity funds and debt, uh, distressed debt funds would very much like to remain passive investors, don't want to take a seat on the board, don't want to be seen as control parties, a strategic investor more often than not will want a voice. And so that may raise different issues. Uh, in addition, if an issuer is taking an investment from a strategic, it may want to consider negotiating a standstill and imposing a limitation, an agreed upon limitation on the ownership and trust that the strategic can acquire so that it has it is not uh, effectively selling itself or selling a control premium to the strategic or preparing itself to be taken over or facilitating that uh, in, in the near term. And so all of these are, are things to think about as these types of transactions uh, are being negotiated. As I mentioned, most of the uh, pipes that we're seeing now involve convertible preferred highly structured preferred that may be more debt-like uh, in spirit, um, structured debt, so it could be secured debt uh, or multiple classes of debt securities with warrants. So, of course, the preferred stock uh, would be expected to bear a dividend. There may be optional or mandatory redemption provisions on the preferred. From an issuer's perspective, it's important to consider the accounting implications of certain terms built into preferred, which might render the security, again, more debt-like and accounted for as a debt security. Typically, uh, the preferred securities would have change of control put provisions and voting rights that are going to be unique to the series, as well as in certain cases or as to certain actions, uh, consent rights or blocking rights. 
and for most preferred, uh, a right to appoint a director uh, in the event that the company has missed two or more dividend payments. Uh, in a lot of these transactions, even where no director seat or special information rights are sought, nonetheless, uh, investors are going to want to protect their interests and they're going to want to see some negative covenants. In your run-of-the-mill pipe, common stock and warrants, uh, you generally don't see any covenants. So uh, it's important to sort of be attuned to the fact that these are deals that are very different in character. So it's not uncommon to see incurrence of uh, limitations on the incurrence of indebtedness, uh, on the incurrence of liens, uh, limitations on the issuance of more senior securities or on amendments to the issuer's certificate of incorporation or the number of authorized shares, uh, limitations on transactions with affiliates. All of these would be considered relatively standard in, in this context. So, as Jen mentioned, uh, one of the principal considerations for pipe transactions generally is ensuring compliance with the applicable securities exchange rules, either NASDAQ or the NYSC. Both uh, the NYSC, NYSC American, and NASDAQ have uh, requirements that impose a shareholder vote in the event of certain uh, private placements or other transactions. So transactions that are completed at a discount uh, that involve the issuance of 20% or more of the issuer's uh, total pre-transaction shares outstanding. And there you're going to look at uh, securities on an as-converted basis. The exchanges also consider whether there are disproportionate voting rights. So uh, you don't <coughs> You also have to look at whether the voting rights of the preferred, for example, are proportionate to the economic investment. There are ways uh, to address some of these limitations, as we point out um, at the bottom, you know, by limiting the voting rights um, by all, uh, of the preferred, um, by limiting uh, the board designation rights and stepping down the board rights as a holder, a new holder's percentage in stake is reduced. So those are all ways to navigate and thereby not have to undertake uh, the shareholder vote. Both exchanges have change of control shareholder vote requirements. In your typical pipe, these don't come up because you have multiple purchasers and no single purchaser usually is acquiring a big stake. In these transactions, uh, these issues almost inevitably come up because you have a single purchaser acquiring a substantial position or you have a group of affiliated funds that are acquiring a significant position and acting in concert as a group. For these determinations for both NASDAQ purposes addressed on this slide and for the NYSC, these are facts and circumstances determinations. Uh, the exchanges will look at the ownership before the transaction as well as um, looking at the changes brought about by the transaction. So a purchase, as we know, of 20 to 30 uh, percent may not be a change of control depending on, on factors like uh, board representation, uh, blocking rights, voting rights, uh, rights of first refusal. And, and similar rights. So it's going to be highly dependent on the terms of the transaction. Both exchanges also impose some limitations on sales to related parties. So these would be directors, officers, other employees, or consultants. In the case of NASDAQ, to the extent that shares are sold at a discount to these related parties, that can be viewed as and accounted for as a compensatory arrangement. So generally, sales to these related parties for NASDAQ companies have to be made at or above the minimum price for NASDAQ. The NYSC traditionally has had a somewhat restrictive uh, requirement related to transactions involving sales to related parties, whether or not involving a private placement. Now recently, in acknowledgement of the difficult economic environment 
the NYIC filed and the FEC yesterday approved a oh, temporary, temporary waiver. This is a waiver for NYSC listed companies that's effective through June 30 for transactions involving related, tra uh, related parties to the extent the transactions approved by the audit committee. It's for cash and it meets the minimum price requirement. Um, similar uh, changes have been made to the bona fide financing exception, which is usually used for purposes of um, the uh, of Rule 144A transactions. So before I hand off to Jen to talk about material non-public information, I just want to briefly cover a few other considerations. Often, a uh, new holder will want to stay under the 9.9 .9 or 4.9 percent threshold or 19.9 percent threshold, a way of structuring uh, such a, an arrangement would be for the issuer to issue prepaid warrants. So we have a few slides that discuss uh, prepaid warrants and uh, how you can uh, effectively delay acquiring ownership of the company's common stock to the extent that you're concerned about bumping into ownership thresholds. Now, there are a few other securities law considerations for holders that become large stakeholders. So in certain instances, uh, if they acquire more than 10% of a class of equity security, they may uh, become subject to ownership, require, ownership reporting under Section 16 in the short swing rules, or uh, may become subject to Section 13 reporting, uh, Section 13D for those that have uh, something other than a passive interest, or G uh, if they meet certain passive uh, investor criteria. So all of that as well is to be considered, not just uh, the beginning, you know, how, how you acquire your ownership interest, but what it's going to mean for a fund that becomes a significant owner. We have a few slides on pipes to finance acquisitions, uh, which we're going to skip over. And I'm going to um, ask Jen to just mention some of the heightened concerns regarding material non-public information in this uh, coronavirus era. Sure. Thanks, Anna. So. Uh, um, and we skipped over a few slides earlier on about material non-public information, uh, but we did discuss a little bit around Reg FD and providing certain information to um, investors that has not yet been made publicly available. So the issuer and the placement agent will need to carefully consider what information will be shared with investors, um, if anything beyond what's in the Exchange Act reports. And you know, typically, since it's just Exchange Act report documents that get put into um, the PPM, um, if an issuer has already disclosed issues, uh, and this is, includes COVID-19, um, then that's great. Then those in, the information will get included into the private placement memorandum and part of the package that gets sent to investors. However, there are a lot of issuers that are considering or that have ongoing issues related to COVID-19, and they need to consider when they're ready to publicly release that information. It could be um, information relating to the pandemic's impact on their results or financial condition. Uh, it could be issues related to, you know, there could be potential cybersecurity issues with everyone working from home. Um, you know, there could be illnesses of uh, principal or executive officers that would cause them to be have to step away from their duties or potentially step away. And it's it's we are, we're in an ongoing, changing, uh, daily basis environment. So issuers will need to think if they're going to be doing a securities transaction, um, what's material, what needs to be described to those pipe investors, when that needs to be described to the pipe investors, um, if it's going to be described prior to releasing that information to the public. Obviously, you will want to more strongly consider confidentiality agreements um, and, uh, and determine, you know, if you're ready to disclose that information. Some issuers aren't. Um, they haven't been able to, to uh, collect enough information to know the impact on the company. And, and that's okay to say that, too, um, if you just don't know what the impact will be. 
that's fine. Just remember that you know if you choose to speak any of your disclosure to the pipe investors and then also to the public has to be complete and not missing any material information. So it's okay to say you don't know what the impact will be. Just be complete when you can um, and be careful not to mislead. So um, certainly the SEC has uh, issued some recent uh, guidance on Reg FD and insider trading around the coronavirus. And there's a couple of topics that you might want to take a look at. Um, one is CF Disclosure Guidance number nine that was released a few weeks ago on the 25th of March. Um, the other is the SEC's Division of Enforcement Statement on Market Integrity. And they both very specifically detail the SEC's concerns in this environment about market integrity and provide guidance and some statements related to um, trading on material non-public information and ensuring that Reg FD is followed and that any information that gets disclosed is not selectively disclosed, or if it is, that you follow Reg FD's guidelines to simultaneously or promptly disclose that information to the public. Um, and I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on COVID-19 um, and MNPI. Well, I would just point out that, of course, it's always an option uh, for an issuer to agree, provided that the, purchaser, the potential purchasers are willing to have the potential purchasers remain uh, restricted for a longer period of time. It's important, though, right up front uh, for the issuer to discuss with the placement agent what information is going to be shared, when it's going to be uh, generally made public, the company's willingness to cleanse uh, investors of potential uh, material non-public information and in an environment where issuers can rely on the SEC's um, order delaying or allowing for delayed filings. I think it's particularly relevant for issuers to consider even before undertaking one of these transactions uh, if they intend to rely on the order for let's say, for calendar companies for their uh, first quarter 10Q. I think that that brings us to the end of our time. Um, thank you all very much for your questions. Both Jennifer and I are happy to answer uh, additional questions as they come up when uh, you're contemplating uh, similar transactions. And we would ask that you just uh, look to um, the materials that are referenced in uh, the resources section as well as on our pipe transaction resource page. So you'll find uh, frequently asked questions about pipe transactions, charts, and other helpful material, and those are also accessible on, uh, on or through our blog. And on our blog, uh, we've been providing updates on a number of the SECs and the securities exchange actions in response to COVID. So thanks to all of you for joining us today and uh, happy to help as you contemplate transactions moving forward.